Um, thanks very much uh, to Fusion Sport. Thanks to James for the invitation to speak today. Um, I feel uh, very humbled and, um, and privileged to be able to uh, be part of this, this forum. And I'd like to thank all of the speakers over the last two days. Um, the, the presentations have been fantastic. Uh, I really wish there was a way for me to harness all of the great messages uh, within those, those uh, presentations and condense them into a one-page uh, executive summary document that I can put up my command chain because uh, it seems to be the only way that I can communicate. And it, it's really hard to, to really get across um, the importance of, uh, of this human performance opportunity for Air Force in terms of looking after our people and um, enhancing our capability. Um, so i just work out how I'm going to get into this. There we go. All right, thanks, you did give me that, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the Air Combat Group Fighter Fit program. Um, as Kirill said, it's a program we put together to address a specific problem of um, aircrew neck injuries, which I'll, I'll describe. Uh, but essentially we've established a high performance uh, team type of um, uh, system uh, over the top of that, uh, that fighter pilot community. Um, and we've been able to demonstrate to Air Force a, a system for um, human performance optimization, which is looking after our people uh, in accordance with um, the work health, work health safety uh, legislation requirements, um, which is a great motivator. We've demonstrated a reasonably practicable way of looking after people better, mitigating a risk, um, and something that we can duplicate in other parts of our workforce. Um, so I'll kind of segue uh, into that. Um, when I was putting these slides together, I was really, um, you know, I did stop and think, you know, what is it about our stuff that's going to be relevant to a pro sport type of community? Um, and I guess the more I listened over the last few days, the more I see that all of the themes are exactly the same. Um, so we've heard from, we heard from Kim um, talking about the importance of having an athlete-led um, HP program and, you know, I'm constantly talking about the importance of operator-led um, stuff within my organisation. Um, in the past, we've always sort of had a, had a problem that looks like it's in a bit in the medical space and it's like, okay, medical, you go and solve that problem for us and we'll turn over here and start playing with our aeroplanes for a while and wait for them to deliver something that sort of sits beside what we're doing operationally. Uh, and then we find that it's just really hard for people to comply with it. It's just, you know, it's not integrated with the way we do business and it just never achieves the effect that we were, were hoping for. So the operator-led bit is, um, is really important. Um, we heard Simon, Mark, and probably most people talking about the importance of the, um, the human uh, element, you know, that sort of connection. And I'll talk a little bit about that within uh, our cultural uh, challenges, our cultural st uh, strategies how important and how valuable that time is and you know, in the way that we, we contract and we operate and all that sort of stuff, um, there's actually a lot of barriers in the way we do business to, to achieving that and delivering that in a way that makes these programs effective. Um, so that's really important. And I, I think Sandra put up a slide the other day with all the challenges facing um, New Zealand cricket and I felt like I could have just cut and pasted that straight into my presentation and talked about the challenge, challenges that we're facing. So. Uh, it's, all, it's all very, very relevant, I think. Um, in our context, um, you know, w with all the compliance issues, uh, you know, trying to get people to actually fill in their smarter base and all that sort of stuff, I think, I think the themes are the same, you know, trying to find what are those motivators in humans that allow them to do the stuff we need them to do. Um, we, for us, you know, it's a little bit different, I think, uh, and I'm not sure, but when you've got a small elite group with a, you know, quite a lot of, uh, you know, HP resource around them, you can probably fill in the blanks a little bit and sort of fill it in for them and push them and um, they've got sort of other motivators. Uh, for us, with a large workforce, with a very diverse uh, demographic, you know, I think some of those problems become magnified and we really need to come up with, you know, some social marketing strategies and all sorts of things around that to, um, to get that compliance and hopefully we can, you know, add to the conversation um, by really, really working on those sorts of uh, tactics, if you like. A um, couple of disclosures. Firstly, um, I tend to be a bit passionate about this stuff. I think like most of the people here, um, I do express my opinions a lot and uh, quite loudly at times, but they're my opinions. They're not, uh, they don't represent uh, the views of uh, the Royal Australian Air Force at this point. I will talk about where we're at in terms of our journey towards um, uh, human performance as I go. Um, I did write up here, I've got no conflicts of interest to disclose. I should say that you know, my team uh, does use SmarterBase. Uh, we've got a contract with Fusion Sports in there. Um, and it's a great tool uh, for us as well. Um, I also should mention, um, as mentioned before, I am a fighter pilot. We have a tendency to uh, behave as though we're the smartest person in the room and we know everyone else's business better than they do. Um, 
but you know, I'm not going to pretend that I understand the sports science anywhere near, you know, to the depth of, of what you guys. I love it. I'm, I'm really interested in it, and I don't want to embarrass myself by trying to talk about it here. So I'm going to try to focus on the organisational and the cultural uh, stuff that's sort of the driver behind this. All right, a uh, little bit on uh, my background. First of all, if uh, for the first 20 years of my career, if you'd asked me to define high performance, I would have pointed it at one of these pictures. Um, so that's, you know, and that's really uh, illustrative of, you know, Air Force as an organisation. When we think about capability, it's about the platforms, it's about the technology, it's about the tactics of how we uh, employ those. Uh, and we really haven't you know, looked enough in depth at, you know, what underpins all of that is people and it's how those people operate, you know, that, you know, there's a, an opportunity to optimise performance by looking at those pe at how those people op operate. So uh, that's the opportunity space for us is to sort of move away from that old way of thinking. We still need to focus on this stuff. It's really important. Um, but um, but we need to focus on the people and that's that's sort of the journey now. Uh, my background, uh, I did uh, have an operational career flying these things up here. Um, uh, yep, high performance, definitely. Um, incredible rates of acceleration. You can be just, um, you know, bumbling along, uh, feeling like you're about to fall out of the air, doing probably around 300 kilometres an hour. Um, plug in the afterburner uh, somewhere at low level and you're probably accelerating greater than 100 kilometres an hour every second. Um, going up towards, you know, twice the speed of sound. Um, they turn very tightly. Um, they roll incredibly fast, incredibly manoeuvrable. Uh, in fact, you can't uh, push the stick all the way to the stops and back to the middle fast enough to stop the thing from rolling more than 360 degrees around. Um, so highly manoeuvrable. Um, what does all that mean for the person inside? There's a lot of physiological stuff going on, a lot of forces um, going on, as well as all of the cognitive stuff that's happening. We've got data inputs from all sorts of, you know, fancy technology, stuff that you're processing, you're listening to stuff that's going on on the radios, and you're building a picture on what's happening, you know, in, in a radius of hundreds of miles around you, knowing what's going on there in terms of a tactical situation. So. Uh, a lot of stuff going on for the human inside of that, that cockpit. Um, down the bottom here, we got a couple of lead-in fighter trainers, and this is what I was uh, flying around low level in England uh, and Wales, um, Scotland, um, doing some training over there, uh, training the British Air Force. Um, some really interesting, um, uh, I guess, you know, insights for me in terms of the differences in our cultures and. Um, we, you know, we're delivering the same job, but there were, there were some differences, um, and some differences in, in, as well in how we look after people. Some stuff that they do a lot better than we do, and some, some things they could probably learn uh, from us as well. Uh, one of my experiences over there, and you know, again, cultural thing, uh, my, my perception of this, a little bit of the stiff upper lip thing, um, I, I flew over there a lot more often than I was used to flying, and very high G stuff, just day after day after day, probably sometimes four times a day. Um, I was completely broken after three years of doing that uh, and luckily I came back into a ground job for a couple of years because I, I felt like I needed the rest. Um, uh, Nick was, uh, was gone, um, I was, I feel like I'm about to say Jehovah, I was seeing a Cairo like almost every, you know, every month trying to look after that but I've tried all sorts of things over my career to try to manage that, that, these problems. Um, and I was getting this really strange sensation when I'm sitting there under G, looking over the back at the student, just sort of waffling around doing something weird behind me. And I, I felt as though I could, you know, I had this real awareness of my organs stretching inside my body and all this sort of stuff, stuff that I'd never, you know, it, it had been aware of before. It's, it's like I had a lot more time to think about it or something. Uh, but I came back feeling really weird after that. So physiologically, um, it is something that needs to be managed. And I guess in that environment, it wasn't probably considered enough. Um, this is uh, our version of that trainer and this is um, where probably this program started. So I was um, in an executive position here, training our junior fighter pilots and too often seeing, um, you know, seeing young kids basically broken in the job and uh, we got to send them to fly transports or something else um, because, you know, they, they just, their necks now have chronic problems. Um, the other thing here, you know, and, and it's probably similar to some other comments um, heard earlier, um, we'd have uh, people not make it through the training because they're not achieving the operational outcome and, um, you know, our culture would generally say, oh, they don't have it, you know, they're, they're not up to, up to it, you know, they're gone, they'll go and fly something else. 
Um, but then we sort of started looking at it and going, well, you know, he's a bit of a skinny kid, a little bit underdeveloped. Um, this is a really demanding bit. So pull in, you know, the physios. We've got uh, James here who was, um, you know, the one physio we were calling in at the time. It's like, look, can we just get this guy kind of measured and just see, you know, how's, how's the range of motion, you know, what kind of core strength and things, you know, what's going on there? Uh, and really, we had an assessment. They, they just weren't strong enough, mobile enough for what they needed to do in the cockpit in order to, you know, achieve the operational outcomes. And it's something we hadn't considered. It certainly not wasn't part of our training program. Um, so, I guess that background gave me a lot of context in terms of the um, the physiological uh, demands, and, and really probably inspired uh, the direction that we we went in here. Um, all right. So, what I'll do, I'll just give you a quick overview of Fighter Fit, uh, what we're doing. Uh, describe the strategy with reference to what we've called the injury prevention spectrum, uh, which is just a way uh, for us to communicate up the chain, uh, you know, what the space we are playing in is and why it's different to what our Joint Health Command does and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's, it's been a really good tool in that sense. Um, outline the sports science elements in, in our context, how we've applied them and how, uh, you know, how, how we've had to be different to the normal defence way of doing things and, and where those differences have allowed us to be successful. Um, I'll present uh, the results of Fighter Fit, um, uh, what, what I believe our overall keys to success are and then sort of segue into um, you know, our opportunity here to shift to a preventative healthcare system for Air Force, uh, hopefully for defence, and, um, and optimising human performance within that. Uh, okay, so little video. Um, I am talking about planes, so I thought this might be good. Um, I'll just describe a few things uh, that you'll see here and some of the things that you're not going to see to give you some context. Um, this is um, a quick clip of what we call BFM, or basic fighter manoeuvres. Um, it's one versus one, or one v one uh, dogfighting. Um, one plane, well, you know, two planes trying to shoot each other out of the sky. Uh, we do this, you know, from different types of, um, uh, you know, set up type of situations. Fighter pilots like to use their hands. Uh, this is like a defensive uh, situation. The, the guy in the camera here is out the front. He's the defender. And at the start, when you hear fights on, um, he has someone behind him here at about half a mile simulating a missile shot. Uh, at that point there, uh, he will break turn and start defending, try to defend against that missile, first of all, and then try to deny another opportunity to shoot, keep the other guy outside of a, a, what we call a weapon employment zone. Um, so it, it, it's quite quick. Um, there, he'll be processing quite a lot of data here. He's got to keep track of where the other aircraft is. He's got to react to that aircraft, you know, in sort of split second sort of timing. Um, He's got the old style of helmet here, which doesn't have the helmet mounted sight that we fly with these days, um, which adds a lot more weight out the front here as well, and gives you all of the information right in front of your face and kind of follows you around. All of his flight information is, is out the front here on a head-up display. He's got a scan to that, so he knows how far he is from the ground, he knows how far he can commit his nose down. Um, he wants to maintain certain air speeds, which mean that he's, you know, at the right, um, you know, at the best turn performance he can achieve, certain ang angles of attack and all that sort of stuff. Some of it you can do by feel. You do need to be cross-checking um, your, uh, your instruments for this. Uh, and uh, at the same time, he's got to be monitoring his fuel. Uh, we burn fuel extremely fast when we're doing this, and if you miss it, you're not going to have enough fuel to get home. And that's just, that's just in training. It's a, it's a real thing. So, you know, while you're focused on all this, you know, playing airborne PlayStation stuff, you need to be aware of the real stuff that's probably going to hurt you. So all of that's going on. At the same time, uh, you'll see out the back here uh, what we call ecto, which is you know, this sort of vapour stuff that's going to you know, be generated by all the air pressure uh, changes on the top of the wing because we're turning you know, very tightly. When that ecto is really big, you're probably seeing uh, you know, about 7 to 8G in that aircraft, which means everything in that cockpit weighs 7 to 8 times more than what it does right now. Um, your head with the helmet and all that sort of stuff on, his, his neck's probably supporting about 80 to 90 kilos at that point, okay, while that's going on. Uh, when he eases off, and you'll hear at one point he'll say ease, uh, that ease, feel, like if, you, if you're used to this, it feels like you ease, it feels like everything's gone, but you're probably sitting at about 5G at that point, so you know, now it's weighing about 50, 60 kilos. Um, and uh, so all of that's happening. So whilst you're supporting that weight on your neck, 
Um, you're also trying to stop the blood from exiting your brain, or firstly your eyeballs, stopping you from being able to see, and then stopping it from you know, leaving your head and, and putting you to sleep. All right, so uh, we're doing a G-straining manoeuvre. You've you got a G-suit that's inflating, but you need to be doing this you know, sort of whole body tensing thing. Um, try to you know, r restrict those, uh, those arterial sort of flows, keep that blood up in your head and, and all that sort of stuff. So a whole bunch of stuff going on. Uh, anyway, so I'll let you watch the video uh, with all that in mind. 5,000. 4,000. 5,000. Roll, sit. Hook! <laughs> 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 Jeremy, 35 Alpha. Give it to him. Okay, he's come off ease. All right, so that, that's about the most basic that we get in terms of this type of um, manoeuvring type of training. Um, that, that's a really quick one, that sort of defensive set. It's just, you know, you end it once you get out of a weapon employment zone. Um, these things can go for, you know, a few minutes, um, depending on the type of, of thing we're, 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 we're trying to train in. Um, we've had University of Canberra do a whole bunch of modelling stuff for us when they had, um, you know, cameras and accelerometers and all sorts of things going on. Um, and really analyse what's going on. And I think within a two-minute fight, they were counting something like 120 different head, you know, head movements and, and things like that going on with all those forces. So that, that's the environment, and that was kind of our problem set. This, this stuff that we're doing here um, is, is really important as part of our training. Uh, Aircrew air need to be good at this stuff. Um, and so it's really hard to, to not do it, um, and we need to sort of figure out how do we do it without breaking people routinely. Uh, all right, so uh, what we knew in terms of aircrew neck pain, well, the data we had was really poor. Um, I heard something about dancers not wanting to, um, uh, you know, tell doctors that they're not feeling well um, or that they're injured. Uh, aircrew, exactly the same. You know, you don't trust the doctor. They're going to ground you. Um, you're not going to be grounded. You just, you'll go and sort it out yourself. You're just going to keep flying. And uh, aircrew generally wouldn't walk in to see, a, you know, medical section um, until they were so broken that they had absolutely no other choice. And now, you know, the path back to full health is... Um, uh, much harder. Um, so we knew this. We knew it was part of our culture. I, I self-managed it for years um, and, you know, had my sports physio in town and sports massage and all this stuff that I was paying for trying to, you know, just maintain my, uh, my flying status myself. Um, in 2016, we asked uh, our Institute of Aviation Medicine to, uh, to try to really articulate this problem uh, a little bit better. This is Air Forces all around the world have been trying to really um, uh, you know, get, get the right data on this for years and, and not been all that successful. Um, they put together some great um, anonymous surveys. Um, it was basically a message to the air crew, look, we, we know all this stuff happens. We know we self-manage. We don't care. Um, we just need the data so that we can build something here to help. And the, the messaging there kind of worked. We got some good responses. Uh, and the data we got out of that identified that out of a population of a, probably under 250 active fighter air crew in the country, uh, we would lose about seven man years of productivity um, for people not being able to fly because of um, neck and back problems. 95% um, of the air crew surveyed performed at suboptimal levels you know, when they were flying. Um, and again, that's, that's my own experience. And, you know, as you get old and wily, you start to figure out these techniques of how to do it with a sore neck and, you know, you, you know the way you use the mirrors against, you know, inexperienced guys. And, you know, I can drive the fight, so I'm only turning right because I don't really want to have to look over the left today because um, the left kind of hurts. Um, we also knew that, uh, you know, the reporting was bad. Um, importantly there, we estimated a, a, a rate of attrition of permanent partial disability of about 1%. So in, in my career, I'm used to seeing a couple of my buds every year, you know, off with, you know, degenerated vertebrae and discs and things and um, not able to fly again. Um, and, you know, turn around like this, you know, for, for the rest of their lives. Um, 
culturally, that was just that's just that was just accepted, right? That's just part of the job. Um, in fact, I remember talking to some of the older fighter pilots, you know, who were flying Hornets when I first started, and um, you know, these guys had flown Sabres and Mirage and early days of Hornet. Uh, and I remember one of them in the bar talking about, oh yeah, you know, it's like the like the aircraft has these fatigue monitoring things on you know, on it, you know, and it counts up these fatigue markings and the airframe has a certain life um, and you see that we call them fooies and the fooies rack up and then when it runs out of fooies, you know, the aircraft's parked. And he's talking about how, uh, oh yeah, your neck's got fooies, you know, it's just like the aircraft's got fooies and at a certain point you just click over, you know, the fooies and, and you're done and that's, that's, that was just the culture that that's, that's, just, um, that's just the job. Uh, so anyway, so at this point we said, well, no, maybe, maybe it's not the job. Um, uh, the way Air Combat Group uh, responded here, um, well, first of all, the data made sense because all the commanders experienced it themselves. Um, it, it, it fit with our, our experience of the world and, um, uh, and said, yep, okay, well, it's time to do something about this. Uh, we pulled out, um, you know, our operate, operational risk management uh, sort of, um, you know, mindset and we thought, right, we're going uh, to address this properly, um, assess the risk in accordance with our, um, our risk matrices and then, um, you know, have a look through the hierarchy of controls and, and all that sort of stuff. So we established a steering group, um, put a whole project management process and some resources, and what we came up with initially, uh, you know, our risk assessment with all the data, uh, we had a high risk from a WIHS perspective, a high risk of operationally significant neck pain and a high risk of permanent partial disability. That's significant because under the legislation that, you know, now we know, hey, um, you know, Air Commander Australia, you're the accountable officer here. So for us to continue operating like this, you need to be aware and sign off that you're prepared to accept this risk. Uh, and he won't do that unless we can, you know, show him a plan for trying to mitigate it as far in accordance with the legislation. So that, that's, that's a, um, once it's documented, it's not just air crew complaining about it, um, we now have, um, you know, a mandate to do something uh, about it. Um, so we, we gathered an SME team there. Uh, this, is, you know, this broke down a few silos. Um, you know, we, like I pulled in uh, James, who was our asset from Joint Health initially, um, and uh, you know, uh, we handpicked a PTI, and that was kind of our starting point. And having a physio and a PTI in the same room um, was kind of unusual, and trying to work together on the same pro problem. Okay, that's, that's unusual within our system. Um, you know, just geographically, uh, culturally, if I think of Williamtown as an example, we've got a gym, a health centre, you know, psychologists, you know, all within about a 300 metre radius, and people will work in those buildings for decades and not know each other, never met, right? Um, so breaking down those silos and getting them in a room and working on a problem together was, you know, a pretty revolutionary start in some ways in terms of the way that we, we do business. Um, but we grew that team and, um, you know, we, we had, in fact, we had a, like, you know, engineering um, support there, um, project management support, giving us, you know, some processes to follow and helping us, you know, along the line there. And importantly, it was operator led as well. So as opposed to say, hey, yep, deliver a problem. No, we need this tailored to our way of doing business if it's going to work. Um, and so we, we sort of led that process there as well. Um, that team grew. Uh, I've got a bunch of my SMEs here. Um, so we've got a HP team now, um, primarily uh, made up of S&C coaches, EPs, physios at the moment. Uh, we are looking at to growing. Uh, you know, we want, we want sports psychology, we want nutrition, all that sort of stuff. Um, so anyway, so we went through a whole bunch of options uh, included reviewing what we're doing. Do we need to do so much high G stuff? Um, is there ways that we can change what we do? Uh, engineering solutions, can we change the seat angle? Can we do things in the cockpit? Uh, and there were some options in there um, that were seriously being considered in, you know, that would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And really we, we don't know how effective they would have been. We've been having these problems since we were flying, you know, hurricanes and spitfires and leather helmets. Um, so, you know, a 200 gram lighter helmet might help a bit, but is it going to solve the problem? Um, the thing that we hadn't done properly before was the human aspect and, and looking after people. We'd done it in the sense that, you know, occasionally there's a bit of education. Oh, look, you know, hey, being fit's really important or doing, you know, go and do some neck exercises. And that's about it. It wasn't part of our way of doing business. Um, so uh, what we what we what became the centerpiece of our program, I guess, um, was the, um, the the human performance program or fighter fit. Um, the way we described it was with the injury prevention spectrum. Um, again, this is the bit where I'm in danger of embarrassing myself, but um, essentially we just laid out, you know, the 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 transition from uh, you know full health through injury, you know, a, a, as a spectrum. Okay, 
and that there are a whole bunch of milestones before injury that are identifiable, that, you know, we, we, you know, if we've got the right monitoring in place with, you know, systems like Smarterbase and the right team there, uh, we can identify these milestones and return people to full health with some intervention. Um, so, uh, and importantly, we had to differentiate that because, you know, we had, we had some sensitivities, we've got joint health command, hey, no, injury's our space, and in fact, well, yep, injury is their space over here. They don't really, they're not, they're not set up to, to work on us before injury. Um, so you walk in there and you go, well, I'm not injured. Um, you know, they, after waiting a couple of hours in the waiting room, um, you know, th then you'll probably, um, you might get looked at, but, but, you know, you're probably wasting their time. Um, so this, this, it was important to highlight that, look, this is a void at the moment. No one is looking after us in this space. And this is the bit we need to build. Um, so primary prevention, um, match fitness, j d really defining that, that was, that was the most important part. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but, you know, load or the, 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 the load that our work environments put on the humans, um, we don't know enough about it and therefore we don't manage it, you know, and people, you know, develop problems over time uh, due to load, whether that's physiological load, mental load, whatever it is. Um, so defining match fitness was really important. Uh, and and w then where, where do we put that definition? Well, the most important thing for us as, uh, you know, with a duty of care responsibility, you know, what level of resilience do we need people to be at to not be at high risk of injury? You know, that's, that's an important milestone and we can start making some, some management decisions around that. And we need a system that actually enables them to achieve at least that level of condition before we expose them to risk. Um, so that, that's kind of the approach that we've taken there. Uh, and that's primary prevention. Secondary uh, prevention stuff, well, yep, that is your monitoring systems. Uh, that is having your SMEs in there. Um, and, you know, and, and there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, di different types of, uh, you know, catch-all mechanisms there. So, yep, sometimes the monitoring system picks up, you know, the need to go and have a look at someone for some intervention. Sometimes it's the fact that we got SMEs, you know, with the time to be walking the corridors and eyeballing people and having chats with them and actually dragging them in because, yep, they've picked something up. And a lot of the time, because this stuff is in their face, it's the air crew now, you know, becoming a bit more self-aware and self-referring themselves. So, so the whole system sort of works there in terms of that, that, um, that secondary prevention uh, piece for the identification and then having the resources in place to actually do something about it. Um, so taking it out of our, our, our birth in the physiological realm, um, yep, we, you know, what I'm, what I'm sort of selling to, uh, to Air Force is, you know, all the words on here are equally relevant whether we're talking about physiological load, uh, mental load, emotional, you know, wh whatever it might be. Um, we, there is an ability to be operating in that space um, uh, a lot better than what we currently are and also understanding the, uh, the load demands of the, the occupation itself. Um, our traditional resourcing, okay, heavily weighted to post-injury. We fix things after they're broken. Um, it's easy, you know, it's, it's easy for someone who's, you know, in charge of the money to go, yep, okay, yeah, there's something broken, yep, go and fix that. Um, it's harder to be looking at something that's not broken and give you some money there um, to stop it from being broken. Um, it's a bit, you know, just a different sort of mental thing that some people can't get their head around. So um, for us, it's really important now to try to link, um, you know, what investment on that side can do out this end when we start talking about you know, beyond this point where we've got people outside of defence now on medical grounds, um, we've got a massive cost of injury for Veterans Affairs. I think, you know, last year it was something like $12.7 billion annually for, uh, you know, supporting um, uh, injured veterans. Um, and that goes up every year. Um, how do you draw the direct link between that and the potential savings there to, you know, putting some investment in there. It's, um, it takes a lot of work. It's not an easy thing to do. You, you stand here and go, yeah, that makes sense. But in order for people to make, uh, make decisions on that, you, you really need to uh, draw a pretty clear line there. So, um, so that, that, that's taken a bit of effort. But essentially what we're trying to do is say, look, we are, we are now operating in this space. We've got a you know, slightly parallel system to our health system. It's having an effect here. My fighter pilots aren't work, walking through the door here for, for neck treatment anymore. Uh, if we can expand that effect on the other side, well, we can start to actually shift this resource bubble and drag it across there and start doing some more work there and have less people um, sort of, you know, sneak through to the keeper there. All right, so look, this is what it looks like. Sorry, I should have mentioned at the start, I, I, I may talk for far too long, so I'll get my team to just keep giving me 10 minutes, like whatever it is. 
Thanks. <laughs> Don't say that. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right, so look, uh, again, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to be talking about how to suck eggs here, but uh, building resilience for us, okay, in this context. So first of all, uh, we established some gyms, um, which are satellite gyms to our main base facilities, all right, so that's something that's different to our normal system. We had to look at this particular workforce and go, right, what is it about their working day and what they do that makes it hard for them to get over there? Are they going to be able to do it or not going to be able to do it within their, their normal battle rhythms? Uh, and the answer is no. Like, fighter pilots will tell you they are the busiest people on earth, they work 12 hour days and you know they've got no time to do anything. Um, we had to make it accessible. Uh, just the eight kilometre drive around the base was, was going to be too much, it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, we built specialised facilities um, in, in, in their location. This particular work group like to think of themselves as a little bit elite, so um, the fact they've got their own special, you know, facility for themselves is also, you know, a winner if you're trying to get people to do stuff, so that, so that, that helped in this case as well. Um, the, uh, the strength and conditioning coach uh, up there, you know, it's our, our PTIs. We had to upskill our PTIs. Not, we didn't have to upskill Bakes. Um, he already he brought some, some great skills, but we handpicked him. Um, but other PTIs involved in our, in our system, we needed to upskill them with some, you know, external uh, strength and conditioning um, qualifications. We really wanted to bring them out of um, I, what, you know, my opinion, what I think is, is a training system that's more geared towards um, group training and just, you know, it's just the sheepdog keeping, keeping the herd together and sort of barking orders, keeping everyone within, within the lines as opposed to the individualised coaching um, type of delivery that makes people feel, you know, a bit more special, a bit, bit more like they're being looked after, a bit more engaged uh, and, and wanting to do, you know, the program. And we need it to be tailored because we're trying to look after individuals. So that was really important and that has really helped in this, you know, cultural campaign of changing behaviours uh, within this particular workforce. Um, we expanded out the uh, conditioning into some specialised sort of pieces for the spinal problems that we're having. So the, the, the machine that you see there um, is part of a suite of machines that, um, from Finland. Um, they're all computerised. It's, it's, it's a great database for us. You can get, you know, very quick, um, you know, repeatable objective data on people which you can compare over time and compare to their group and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so that's fantastic. Um, you know, we get some, some instant, instant metrics uh, and as a, as a commander or a manager, I can go, right, well, okay, I've got a, a high G program coming up in a couple of months. Let's get everyone screened and see where they're at and then we've got the ability here to, you know, detect any weakness that, you know, hasn't been been noted, um, put them on these machines for conditioning, you know, do, do whatever program, you know, the SMEs decide and prepare them for that. It also gives us the ability to know, you know, within our programming, hey, they've been doing some fairly low G stuff, you know, for, for a while, we're about to hit this, you know, you know in this week they're going to suddenly start um, and it's like, you know, the off season just doing nothing and then turning up on game day for, for match one and, you know, running out on the field and, and getting smashed and you're, you're going to get injured, right? So that, that, that was our way of doing business. Now the guys have the ability to actually use these sorts of things to increase the load in preparation for that part of the flying program as well. And that's being really successful for us. Um, in terms of the, uh, so th and that's all, you know, our wellness monitoring and stuff. Um, Smarter base is obviously part of that. Um, and it's great, like the back end stuff, fantastic. You know, it's a great tool for us. Uh, the compliance stuff's been, been spoken about a bit. That is a challenge. You know, we, we work really hard. Um, you know, these guys work really hard on, on making the air crew do it. Um, and, you know, we, we've got reasonable, I think we're up over 80% type of compliance at the moment on, you know, what we're expecting out of them, which is good, but it's a lot of work and, you know, I do feel we, we're just constantly burning currency with the air crew on that as well. We're going to, you know, the, the patience gets tried a little bit. Um, so, uh, and, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm pushing here. If we want to roll this beyond a group like this who, you know, are a little bit more like a, you know, like a sporting team where you've got certain motivations that are to do linked with their operational performance. If you're trying to roll it out to a broader demographic um, where people maybe are, are less motivated by their, their, you know, their performance outcomes or, you know, even parts of the workforce where, who might, hey, I'm going to get two weeks off because I've got to sort back, it probably doesn't sound like a bad thing. Um, the, you, know, you need other ways of encouraging people to, to use this stuff. So, you know, and I'm, and I'm talking about 
you know, getting getting a little bit evil and taking lessons from gambling and, you know, tobacco advertising and, you know, all, all these people who, who use all these tricks, the dopamine hits and all that stuff that, you know, gets people having a, an immediate sort of pleasure response out of using something and gets them a bit addicted to it um, in order for us to collect the data that we need. Um, you know, and, you know, a few ideas, you know, I'll... I'll throw it there. So air crew love, you know, checking the weather every day, you know, and, you know, if the calendar there was linked to weather zone and, you know, you just, when you're looking at, you know, today's program, hey, you've got a little thing in the corner that's giving you the weather, weather information you need or whatever, it becomes your go-to app for things and you just, you know, just used to using it, you know, a whole bunch of things we could do. You know, the, the survey format is really valuable uh, like, and, and it's great, f you know, from the scientist's perspective, we get a, you know, a lot of data quickly, um, but they get really fatigued by the survey thing and I'm trying to think of how, how do we sneak the survey in? They don't even realise that they're doing it, you know. I wake up in the morning and um, my phone just goes, hey Carlos, how'd you sleep today? Mm. Okay, cool. yeah, and that's it and I've just, you know, filled out part of my survey uh, and it's maybe just collecting stuff on me, you know, a bit more distributed and it doesn't feel like I'm sitting down and doing a survey. I'm, I'm just, you know, this is just how my brain works and, and I sort of, you know, often think, you know, how, how would Steve Jobs do this? Like, um, just thinking outside the box and thinking about how do we win this sort of um, cultural campaign on, on that sort of stuff. Um, all right, uh, I'm talking far too long. Screening, risk stratification, um, with all of that data, you know, we've got some great processes the teams are put, putting together there um, for doing uh, risk profiling periodically, especially when we know we've got, you know, higher risk periods coming up. Um, these things are working, you know, fantastically. Uh, we've got early intervention strategies, you know, we've got, we've got the staff there available and accessible. Um, and really importantly, you know, we've we got continuous improvement going on and we were trying to really uh, keep developing that with our research and our modelling. Um, we've done some great stuff with uh, the guys at UC RISE, um, so the physios and biomechanists down there did some open sim modelling. Um, we've got a great model now for what's going on with our neck forces and they, they pulled, you know, some, some stuff they'd done for scrummaging and whatever else in rugby. Uh, and now we're trying to adapt that modelling um, to, you know, some kind of, you know, accelerometer mounted in the helmet type of, um, you know, in, input where we can just go, right, there's your load for, for that sortie and track it over time with a, a dashboard and, you know, make all those sorts of decisions based on load, feed that into Smarter Base, that would be great. Uh, Importantly, uh, all of this stuff, you know, from a command commitment perspective, you know, it's embedded in our policy and procedures now. We've won the battle in terms of winning over the, the command chain um, within, within this part of the workforce. Um, it's part of the operational battle rhythm, um, you know, and, and, and the way that we do operational risk management on a, on a daily basis, all right? I say all that, and I've probably got Eve and Dan over here going, no, we haven't. Like, there's, we, we've got parts of the organisation where, where we've been more successful. Williamtown is doing great. Uh, Ambly, parts of it are really successful. Parts We're having more trouble getting them into the gym and doing the, the strength and conditioning bit. Uh, we're missing that, um, you know, dedicated PTI element. Uh, and this is, you know, this is a, a, another, um, you know, camp ongoing campaign um, of, of shifting the delivery of, of that. Because at the moment, you know, we, if we ask for PTI support for um, Ambly, They'll go, yeah, okay, what time do you want us to be there? You know, they can do it or they can't do it. Uh, they'll turn up, run a class, and then leave, and that's it. But we need more engagement than that. You know, we, we've got Bakes there who is involved in monitoring, the, you know, the players, the, you know, the athletes there. He's, um, you know, part of the team in terms of coming up with a program and all that sort of stuff. So, so we're actively involved in everything, not just the delivery of, a, uh, of an S&C session. Uh, and that's the, kind of the shift we need to make. We need to make these, these um, HP teams a team and not just different silo elements who just come in and cameo and leave. All right, so uh, in terms of fighter fit, um, we've got a whole bunch of research going on over the top. James is doing a PhD um, as part of this process as well. Um, this has come from, uh, w you know, we do regular six monthly sort of snapshots. Uh, and we look at, uh, I think, it, oh, again, I'm gonna, gonna probably give you a whole bunch of misinformation. I think it's based on three month snapshots, you know, leading up to that survey. Um, got a nod, so that's good. Uh, so anyway, so the, the, our general results are pretty steady now. We, we achieved about a 53% reduction in the occurrence of time loss injuries um, for aircrew. Um, when they do occur, we got a 64% reduction in the average duration time of those injuries. Um, and 
we've also what's not there. We've, we've also seen a shift from sort of uh, reporting of moderate severe pain, sort of shifted more towards the mild um, end of the spectrum as well. So all that's great, and that's really good sort of short-term data for us. Um, we don't know yet what the long-term impact's going to be there in terms of a reduction in the permanent partial disability stuff. Um, but you know, I guess I'm going to be optimistic and think it will have an impact on that as well. Um, Aircrew uh, report improved performance. They talk very positively about the program and it's about how much better they're feeling. They can keep, visual, keep eyes on the other aircraft so much more easily. Uh, all that really intuitive stuff that go, yeah, duh. Um, you know, more endurance and, and all that sort of stuff. So there's an operational, you know, um, capability improvement element to that as well. Culturally, um, yep, not, not trusting medical. And that's not just aircrew, by the way. Like that, that seems to be a pretty endemic uh, issue. Uh, we've had a six-fold increase in reporting to the to the practitioners. So they trust this team. They'll go in there and talk to them about everything. They're seeing them 600% more often, but they're getting injured a lot less. And when they get treated, it's one or two treatments, and you know they're, they're good, and they probably never stopped flying, um, as opposed to going in when they're well and truly broken, and then having weeks and weeks of treatment, you know, on a slow path back to um, back to health. Uh, some more data up there. I won't go through all of this, um, but um, and, and apologies, I didn't put the latest slide up, which only came in last week. But you know, we've got another follow-up, which pretty much holds consistently here. We've had a, a pretty massive improvement in the reduction of injury of, of time loss, which is you know important to us in terms of capability. All right. So uh, case to success, and this is again you know very very loaded with my opinion. Um, the team approach, all right, and just as an example, this is our HP team uh, for Williamtown. Um, we've got our S&C coach, our EP. Sorry, Scotty, I didn't warn you about that photo. Um, we've got our uh, physio there as well, Toby. Um, so Toby's had a, you know, he's got a background with Brisbane Lions uh, as head, head physio. He's worked for Team Garmin in the cycling um, Australian athletics team and a couple of Olympics. So it was really good to get that kind of experience into this, and that's again, that's not a standard defence way of doing business. Um, so I had the luxury of being able to, you know, control what went into tendering for these contracts, and we really wanted to just go a little bit higher and get the right level of experience here to build the, these sorts of programs. Um, I remember talking to Toby that today he first arrived, and it was it was basically going to be my. Uh, you know, a bit of motherhood and brotherhood on how to deal with fighter pilots and, um, you know, just give him a bit of a warning about the types of uh, you know, attitudes and things he might encounter. And, um, you know, and he's, he's just looking at me with a smile on his face. He's like, mate, it's just like, just like football players. Like, like, so, you know, and, and that's, that's been really good because he, you know, he, he knew how to talk to them, um, you know, how, how to rub the ego the right way here and whatever, you know, and it, it's, it's really helped in terms of bringing, uh, you know, bringing them along and, and the success of the program. You know, whilst I'm, you know, I've mentioned Toby, like the whole team's been fantastic in that, in that regard as well. And that human engagement bit has been an absolute, you know, critical key to success as well. Um, and Brent there is our, our, our um, aviation medical doctor as well. So they do, they do a team meeting here, they look at all the smarter based data, uh, plus any other, you know, forms of data and information and observations and um, go through go through the players, who are the, who are the guys that need a bit of attention here, what are the plans, what's going on with this guy this week and, um, and, you know, and, and do all that sort of stuff. So stuff that's probably bread and butter, I'm sorry I'm even talking about it, but really different for defence to be doing, doing this sort of thing. Uh, the command and operational buy-in um, can't do it without that, absolutely not, but you can't do it just with that either, you know. And, you know, I keep getting from people, oh, it's, it's a military, you just tell people to do it and they, they're supposed to do it. Um, and it's like, well, you know, I'm not sure which military you're in, but I haven't seen that work for, you know, 25 years. Um, we rely on that. I see us, see us rely on it time and time again, and then time and time again, we've got 85% of the people not complying, and we blame the people and we blame the culture and it's all their fault. Um, people like 85% of you are all naughty, right? But we never really look at what, what, what was it that we gave to them and why was it that that wasn't really working? You know, how did we design it wrong? Um, that bit we just don't even think about. So that's, that's what we're trying to do differently there as well. Um, operational risk management, well, it is a risk, it, you know, and I'm gonna say this is the same thing as what coaches obviously do um, day in, day out, and that's the, uh, that's the process we're, we're, we're applying there. Um, Operational context to the science, operator-led stuff, you know, that, that's absolutely important. And sometimes I've had to let the SME team down because, you know, hey, the 100% science solution, mm, it's, it's just not going to work. Like, if we try to deliver that, we're going to end up with zero compliance because it's just not going to gel. Uh, and sometimes we've got to accept, you know, the 70% solution because it's actually deliverable. 
Um, Organisational responsibility for compliance, I've, I've touched on that uh, there as well. You know, we, we, when it doesn't work, stop blaming the people and start looking at what have we done wrong here? How do we redesign it? What's the stuff that they're going to like if we change it? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, really at the heart of it, you know, when I put design principles, this is it's all about social marketing. You know, there's all those evil things that they do, make you buy McDonald's. Like that stuff is... Um, you know, that, that stuff works, you know, it, it actually, you, and it's not that people are bad, it's not that they're selfish, um, but they're humans and we just need to be aware of that and, um, and actually understand it, use it. Uh, which is a nice segue into culture. Um, you know, what is poor compliance culture? And this is, you know, what I'm talking about, blaming the people and it's all their fault, they're all naughty. Um, well, no, it's not. And the culture is created by the environment we put the people in. It's how they respond to that stuff around them. Um, and that's the stuff that we've got control over. So um, so we, we, we're trying to get a lot smarter about that. Um, we're trying to, you know, you know what, a question I keep asking our PTIs is, you know, what is it that, you know, makes the gym in town there that they're spending thousands of dollars, you know, that your people are spending thousands of dollars a year on to go and do that instead of doing this for free? Like, what is it that attracts them? Why can't, can we, can we replicate that? Um, and, um, you know, that's the stuff we need, we need to really, really think about. Um, you know, same, same, the stuff I've just talked about with, with, um, with Smarterbase, you know, if, it, if, if they're not attracted to using it at the user end, um, how can we design it differently so they are attracted to use it, you know, and I, I love the stuff that I'm seeing the last couple of days. We, we're absolutely on the right track. So, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, need to look at the systems. Uh, from an organisational perspective, and again, this is my up messaging uh, within defence here, is, you know, what, what are we doing? We're, we're putting the H into WHS, right? And WHS has always been about, you know, slips and trips and chemical exposures and things like that, and how do we prevent accidents? Um, we're not really looking at load and the effect of load over time, and that's, that's the, the, you know, the health part of that. Um, that's what we're, we're trying to trying to do. So this, this is my message. We don't understand load. Um, I went and spent a few hours with our ground refuelling section at, um, at Williamtown, had some scientists up from Deakin Uni with some, you know, data dots sort of stuff and we we're going to go and, you know, try to get a bit of an understanding of the load of, of their task because that workforce is completely broken. They all have back problems. Um, Talking, you know, we had the whole group in, team in there. It was the worst morale I've ever seen in any unit. Um, they're all, they're, they are all broken. Um, stories about just waking up randomly one day and just spasming lower back and had back problems ever since. Um, and when you look at their task, it is difficult. Like, you know, they've got this 25 kilo, um, you know, refueling nozzle thing that they've got to manoeuvre. The people who design aeroplanes never consider the ergonomics of the guy who's going to have to fit this thing in terms of where it is. Um, they've got about 300 kilos worth of fuel between them and the, um, and the truck. Um, they're doing it with all this sort of PPE stuff on that just makes it hard to move. Uh, all the servicing stuff and refueling they've got to do on the truck itself is incredibly r ridiculously designed. Um, and they'll stand there for 40 minutes while a large aircraft's being fueled in whatever conditions, freezing cold in winter, you know, searing heat, whatever. And then they'll have to go and do the, you know, really poor ergonomic, you know, heavy lifting stuff. Um, all, you know, all of a sudden, they're all broken. And I'm asking them about their rosters and their rest periods and all that sort of stuff. And there's no understanding of the load. Therefore, there's no management of it at all in, in, in the way that they're managed. And they're all broken. So um, we need to understand load. That's just one example. It happens all across the organisation. We need to understand load. We need to understand physiological load. We need to understand, you know, mental stress and all that sort of stuff so that we can apply all that prevention stuff um, and, and you know, understand resilience, enable that resilience, so define the load, establish appropriate standards, um, enable the resilience, monitor the team, and then um, manage the risk appropriately there with you know, interventions and, and other, other, other methods. And ultimately, what does it do for us? It allows us to op optimise our performance. In fact, I'll flip it around, and we just focus on human performance and optimise it, and you know, the whole safety bit, the, the, the whole um, you know, WHS bit, is just one of the benefits that, that flows out of it. It's my last slide, I promise. Um, so, you know, ultimately, uh, what I am trying to push here is a shift to, to preventative healthcare. Um, the organisation is accountable, you know, that, that is legislated. We're accountable for that, and um, I think really defining the importance of this understanding load is the key here, so the organisation can accept that. If it's not defined, you know, it's not really a problem yet. 
Um, but we are accountable, so we've got to take control of that and we need operational input in leading that process, um, getting all the great, great advice in here. Uh, it, it requires that integrated team approach. We have to bash down the silos. I've heard all sorts of stories about silos here as well. Uh, our silos are like gal galvanised with like triple steel plated, you know, whatever. People will get very defensive about defending their silo and their little turf. Um, we need them to work together. We need them to be a team. Um, we, uh, it challenges our existing measures of value. Um, I can't remember if I said this in this presentation because I've mentioned it today, so apologies if I'm repeating myself. Um, one, one of the things that, you know, I was getting some criticism early on, uh, you know, our physio at Williamtown, you know, we had some data, they were doing 20 hours of clinical hands-on treatment a week. And, um, you know, and so, oh, joint health, and I had the health centre manager there, you know, offering a bit of, uh, you know, criticism. You know, oh, no, our, our, our physios do 40 hours a week, you know, we can be much more efficient than, you, than you're being. Um, and it's like, well, hold on, but you've been doing this for years and we've had this problem, we've solved this problem. Um, it, the stuff that happens in those other 20 hours is the stuff that's making this work. It's all of that people engagement stuff, it's the monitoring, it's the relationships, it's all that stuff which doesn't happen within our system. In fact, their contracts don't let them do that. They've got to do 40 hours, they don't have time to do that stuff, that's contracted. Um, so. How do we measure the value? It's, well, the value isn't just, is it, you know, how many hours of treatment are you doing? The value is what's the outcome for the organisation? We need to change those metrics. Um, and then, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, all of this, it, it's going to look after our people in the way that we should be looking after them um, uh, and ultimately improves our capability, reducing our lowest costs. 